regard to trying to combat the issues of climate change effectively, if we want to do it in the shortest amount of time and use the least amount of money, then renewable energy is definitely the way to go versus nuclear energy. Hi, welcome to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast, hosted by the Fairwinds crew. I'm Maggie Gunderson, and I'm here today to welcome you to the show. Today we have a really special podcast that we're doing on nuclear energy and on the analysis of total carbon emissions and total cost of ownership versus renewable technologies. Today we are joined by University of Vermont graduates who were interns for us in the fall of 2015 to do this particular study. And we have issued an amazing paper with them, and and we're very thankful for their research. We're joined today by Brandon Welsh, Grayson Webb, Sam Gazy, and John Liebherr. And of course, we have our Fairwinds crew with us, Chief Engineer Arnie Gunderson, and of course, Caroline Phillips, our Program Administrator and Newsletter Maven. So thank you all for joining us today. So let's begin with how the idea originated. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Arnie Gunderson. If you've been following the Fairwinds website for about a year, you might remember that I gave a speech at Northwestern University in April of 2015, and it was covered by Forbes magazine. The title of the story was, Has Tesla Just Killed Nuclear Power? And it's it's had... Over a half a million people have read that that speech, which is, I think, a, an indication of how hungry the people on the web are for accurate information about alternatives to nuclear power. But anyway, when I started developing that, I was working with um, Amory Lovins and Michael Schneider, and gosh, it must have taken me about a week to uh, analyze everything to come up with a 20-minute speech. And I didn't feel like I had enough information. So living in a college town with wonderful, smart seniors, I was able to go to University of Vermont and ask for help to get some more information to beef up that speech even more. My initial question is, why did you all decide you wanted to do this project with Fairwinds Energy Education? Starting off in our class, it seemed like out of all of the projects that we were to choose from in our senior capstone class. This was the project that would have the most impact and push us to use our brains in the best way. A follow-up question to that is, what were your initial impressions when you were first coming in? What did you think you were going to find? Did you think anything? Did you not have any expectations? Or if you did, what were they? I'm Brandon. And initially coming into it, I thought it was going to be it, it was a really intensive research project, but the way I initially approached it is I thought it was just going to be like crunching numbers all day and not actually delving into the social, cultural, and the issues that are actually behind nuclear energy and the lack of people supporting renewables. So when we actually develop, when we actually got into the information and saw that renewables are a real way of developing the future and su- finding a new way to change the grid. I changed my opinion from supporting nuclear energy to now I'm on the fence about it and the data is convincing me to back renewables more than nuclear. I'm Grayson and like Brandon, I just kind of thought we were going to be doing an intensive research project. I picked the project because I thought it was going to be hard and I wanted to push myself and not just pick an easy project to to cruise through for senior year. And I was really pleased to find that this project was so engaging and had us thinking on a different level and we were able to get involved with so many great people. And like Brandon, I also, I wasn't sure about nuclear going into it. And so I was very interested in learning more about the differences between the two energy options, renewable or nuclear. I went from kind of being on the fence about it, not really being sure which option was best. I've grown up in Vermont, so I was witness to the whole Vermont Yankee incidents and and the leakages. And so I didn't really know what to think, but now I'm a pretty firm believer that renewable energy can handle all the load that nuclear can in a much safer way. 
I'm Sam. I definitely would piggyback off of Brandon's point of, you know, when I first saw the kind of proposal for this project, I thought I would just be kind of doing number crunching and helping a little bit with some economic analysis. But when we actually arrived and Arnie presented us with, you know, his idea and whatnot, what first struck me was that he had given this thesis and he said nobody had really empirically proved it before. And that was kind of a shock to me. But then when he really started showing us a lot of the data and the past research that he's done, it was became evident that this was something that hadn't been done yet and needed to be done, frankly, if we were to make the case for renewable energy in the future versus nuclear energy. And then when he came out and basically said, we want you all to compile this research for us and put it into a report. And I just felt very empowered. I kind of anticipated just being a worker bee, but the extent that they actually trusted us to you know, do the research and write the report, I mean, that was very amazing. And, and it certainly gave me confidence professionally, especially for our abilities. And so it was certainly something that I became very much more excited to be a part of right off the bat. And jumping into everything taught me a great, great deal about how to do full analyses. Before, our work in classrooms were always limited to one aspect of the entire cycle of something you know, like an energy facility. But this project gave us the whole scope of things and how to understand, you know, in a very much more holistic sense rather than the, you know, minute biological details of it. That was really fantastic. This is John. And coming into this project, I hadn't really ever thought about energy systems before. And I didn't really have a solid opinion on nuclear power and whether I liked it or not. And this project was definitely a formative experience to getting opinions on the entire industry. And like the other guys said, I came in thinking that this was going to be a lot about economics and number crunching. But what it seemed to turn out to be to me was uh, demystifying the data that everyone has put out there on the internet and around in multiple sources because we weren't just looking at the numbers. We were looking at whose numbers they were. And if they were from a certain source, they could be magnitudes different than uh, another person's source. And we had to take that completely into consideration because we could have had different uh, different, different data if we had used biased sources instead of the um, unbiased sources that we tried to keep. What I found exciting was that we used nuclear industry data. Uh, we, we found the uh, World Association of Nuclear, WANO, and used their information. We've, we used an investment bank, Lazard. So it wasn't like we were cherry-picking the low-hanging fruit that's uh, in the renewables community. We actually were able to dig in and get uh, source material from the nuclear and the investment banking business. What's exciting for me is that I'm normally the final writer on everything, and this is a really well-written research project. We didn't direct you on the research. You did the research. You wrote the paper. And when I finally got to read the final product, I was really stunned and, and just very excited by, by what it showed because we didn't know what we'd find going into this ourselves. While doing the research from the research portion through analysis, what were some of the greatest obstacles that you guys faced? And did you experience sort of one big, oh, aha, this is it moment? One of the toughest data points to find was for the uh, renewable energy for maintenance costs, just because the technologies that we're using today just are drastically different from the ones that are aging on the field. And so we weren't able to really find good points for that. One of the biggest aha moments was uh, when we got our biggest chunk of data from the Lazard Investment Bank, which was an entire report on basically all kinds of energy production and their costs and basically anything to do with them in terms of money. It was a cram pack report that was very unbiased because basically what Lazard is is an investment bank and they just want to know who they need to put their money in. And that just fundamentally has no bias. 
The piece of data that had the biggest variability in this whole analysis is nobody knows exactly how much carbon dioxide we're throwing up into the atmosphere. We were off with low readings of uh, 35,000 million tons and high readings of 50,000 million tons. And at the same time, the Paris Accords were going down about uh, trying to limit CO2. So here we are as politicians trying to limit CO2, but at the same time, the, there's extraordinary variability in exactly how much CO2 we're trying to limit. So here are the politicians of the world making decisions about limiting carbon dioxide. But when you look at the hard data, nobody really knows how much carbon dioxide we're throwing up into the atmosphere yearly. I think that the hardest thing is with the data that Arnie was talking about, with the total carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere, everything's a prediction. And we were also looking at the predictions of the amount of CO2 put into the atmosphere 50 years from now. And nobody has a good idea. It's all very hypothetical, and it just depends on what model they use. And so getting a solid number from that is hard, and we just have to choose which one we think is from the best source. We've sort of beaten around the bush a little bit, but it would be great if one of you all could sort of summarize what your overall results and findings are. So the result of the culmination of research that we did over the total of the semester, essentially we found that it would take 2,891 nuclear reactors in order to sustain the amount of energy that we need in the future up until 2050. And in order to create renewable energy sources that could achieve that same amount of energy production until 2050, we found that a total cost for nuclear reactors would be 22.6 trillion US dollars. And for wind power, it would only be $9.93 trillion. And for solar, it would be $17 trillion U.S. dollars. And this is factoring in the life cycle cost and the capacity factor, which a lot of people don't consider. Uh, for wind, you only have it running about 25% of the time because wind speeds vary, wind direction varies. For solar, you have about a 45% capacity factor because the sun doesn't shine all the time. And for nuclear, it's running at about 90 to 95 percent of the time. But even accounting for these factors, we still see that wind is about half the price and solar is like about 70 percent of the price of maintaining the amount of energy that we need in the future compared to nuclear up until 2050. And with new technology such as Tesla's Powerwall, then we can increase the capacity factor for both wind and solar making nuclear's price skyrocket above solar and wind because that will just be a way to store the energy made when it's being made. So there's no uh, no limit to what can be done. Um, a lot of people have concerns about the recyclability of lithium-ion and other battery technologies, but with Elon Musk's Gigafactory, that is uh, releasing next year. He's actually has a lithium ion recycling portion of the factory. So uh, like you were saying, John, with the power wall and the uh, power stacks they're creating, when those go bad after so many uh, recharges, they can actually take them in, recycle them, and then reuse them and they can be used again. So lithium ion technology shouldn't really be a factor holding back uh, solar and wind storage. Thank you, both Brandon and John. That's really interesting to me, especially the lithium ion issue, because lithium is a resource that's very precious in this world. And a lot of environmentalists are, are concerned that there won't be enough to do this project for batteries and storage. So I think that knowing about the renewability of the lithium ion batteries by Tesla is an amazing thing. I wasn't even aware of that till you just said it right now, Brandon. So thank you. Tesla's Gigafactory is actually going to be placed in Nevada, which has the largest abundance of lithium in the world. That's also going to be another factor in the creation of batteries in the future. That brings me to the question of mining. When you all did this report, did you factor in any of the nuclear costs 
of mining or the decommissioning costs, which are what's called economically externalities? Well, we didn't factor in any of the kind of extraction costs for either nu- nuclear nor renewable energy um, in that regard. But to our understanding, it's a it, if, especially if you were to include the kind of decommissioning costs and extend that towards the storage of depleted uranium rods, we'd have a, a kind of a baseline understanding that it would be a marginally larger costs on the nuclear side relative to renewable energy. So uh, it was kind of a no-brainer. If we were to include that, it would only inflate the cost of nuclear to you know a larger degree. Uh, and so it was not something that we felt like was essential to the argument in the regard, simply because our argument still holds water and pretty credibly uh, without that aspect. So you guys in this paper really focused on the economics of nuclear and comparing that to renewables. Scientists right now are really concerned about CO2 emissions. And although that wasn't the basis of your report, it would be wonderful if you could share what you sort of discovered regarding economics and their relationship to CO2 emissions and our Earth's need to reduce CO2 emissions. Because nuclear, solar, and wind all have around the same CO2 emissions for their life cycle and for running costs, we looked up how many nuclear plants it would take to get a 20% CO2 emissions for the entire world. And then from that, we looked at how many megawatts of power those reactors would make And then that turned out to be a decent amount of power. And so then we looked at how much money it would take to make that same amount of power with nuclear, solar, and wind. And what we finally got was that it would take $22.6 trillion to make nuclear work for a 20% reduction of CO2 emissions, $17 trillion for solar, and just $9.9 trillion for wind. So that's a pretty strong conclusion against nuclear. So just to clarify, you looked at reducing CO2 emissions by 20% and comparing the costs of the amount of nuclear power and construction of nuclear power plants that would be necessary to make that 20% CO2 emission decline. You looked at that amount of money. How much was it? Can you repeat that number again? $22.6 trillion. Okay. And you compared that to looking at a 20% reduction in CO2 emissions from solar? Well, we looked at how much money it would cost to make the same amount of power that nuclear would uh, be making with a 20% decrease in solar. Uh, And how much was that? uh, So that would be to make that 2,483,000 megawatt difference. It's uh, $17 trillion for solar and then $9.9 trillion for wind. All right. And did you guys look at at all at the timeline for how long it takes to construct a nuclear power plant versus to construct a solar field or a wind power field? So solar and wind, I think uh, each maybe take, including planning and construction and permitting, it takes uh, around four years to build utility size project, whereas solar, whereas nuclear can take around 10 years and it can take up to five to get it all planned and permitted. And then they won't even start breaking ground till halfway through that. So takes much longer to build a nuke uh, than it does to start building uh, renewable energies. And when we're talking about CO2 reductions, I mean, we're past 400 parts per million right now. We need to start making reductions right now. So the technology that can get on the ground and up and running faster is vital. And it's not even necessarily just the build time that we have to be concerned about. It's the actual maintenance of the reactors. With a solar field or a wind field, once you install it, you have to go in and maintain all the mechanical properties of it. But with a nuclear reactor, you're basically containing a bomb so that nearby cities and people aren't affected by nuclear radiation if there's leaking or any other problems occurring there. 
so even just the actual maintenance and safety risk that you have to account for are drastically lower with the renewable energies versus nuclear energy. Thank you, Brandon. That's an interesting point. I hear a lot of people talk about small modular reactors and their issues with small modular reactors. There hasn't been one built that's really been a successful small modular reactor yet. But apart from that, they're promoted as a way to decentralize nuclear. But as you just said, that's a great point. Nuclear is always very centralized as small reactors would still need the safety protocol and the safety waste storage of a large reactor that would still remain an issue. And um, as students of environmental science and studies, what do you think of the time and cost comparison between small modular renewables versus these small modular reactors? Well, I think that brings up the question of what kind of energy system that we want and kind of the future of the grid in regards to a centralized versus a distributed model of energy production. And I think the argument that modular nuclear plants make as far as a means to be a decentralized power system is you have to consider it relative to what else is out there as far as production. And when compared to things such as wind, you know, especially even backyard wind or solar panels that can easily be established just on a a residential rooftop. So when trying to make the argument that these small modular nuclear power plants are a decentralized form of energy production, it's a little bit of a stretch, especially compared to residential rooftop solar and backyard wind and whatnot. And so if we want to, if we're concerned about, you know, the effects of, you know, potential, you know, even natural destruction in, we've even seen with past Hurricane Irene in Vermont itself, if we had had Vermont Yankee just a little further north in that case, and that were on a different river than the one it was on, there could have been some serious, serious destruction to that and which could have opened up the floodgates to nuclear radiation throughout the state and just throughout even the Northeast. And so compare that to if that were just a small solar field, uh, you know, producing the same amount of electricity, it would have very drastic kind of effects both environmentally on human health and and whatnot. And so when we want to think about a energy system that's resilient, resiliency comes in the form of distribution, not centralization, because you do not want to maximize exposure within certain areas. You want to distribute your exposure, just like a good financial portfolio. So it's certainly something that you would need to consider when trying to make the argument that if we're trying to push for a distributed system, is nuclear the way to go? And is that going to protect us in the long run, especially as we see the increased environmental effects of climate change in the the form of extreme weather patterns and whatnot? You all are recent graduates, roughly 21, 22 years old. Um, I'm curious if you could share with the Fairwinds audience your experience having been University of Vermont students in the Rubenstein School environmental programs. If you can share what your fellow classmates who are entering the energy field, what energy fields are they going into? From your schooling, did you discuss nuclear power? Did you discuss alternative energies? And if you did, was there an emphasis on any particular one? And sort of what was your experience in college with the environmental energy sort of movement as we know that we need to steer away from fossil fuels? I think there's a lot to be said for what inspires students to study what they study. And I think, you know, the vision that has been instilled into us of a renewable energy future is a lot more promising than any other, particularly a petroleum-based future which we're already experiencing, or a nuclear-based future. And I think a lot of it is due to the fact that, you know, renewable energy, we have the issue of climate change, and renewable energy is just the most clear solution towards hedging the potential damage that that will cause on us. And so I think there's a lot more that is... A, yet to be explored with renewable energy because it's also a relatively new field, but B, there's a lot more that will be provided to us, not just in an academic sense, but 
almost in a security sense that, you know, if we have enough people finding the solution towards power storage or finding the solution towards high costs and whatnot within the renewable field, that will only yield greater benefits outside of potentially high incomes for the students that discover that stuff. It ensures that there are future generations for us to continue to inhabit this planet. And so I think that yields a lot more inspiration, like I said, for students, It's and particularly in regards to nuclear energy. I mean, I, I can certainly say I know one or two petroleum engineer students, and they're not at UVM. I went to high school with them. But aside from that, everyone else that I know is is studying renewable energy, and nobody that I know is, is studying nuclear just because of kind of the factors that I previously mentioned. Also, I think that the culture just – Even outside of the energy field or people who are trying to go into the energy field at colleges is really going towards the green movement and kind of people who are looking towards making their lives a lot easier on the earth. And people who I know who are in the UVM business school, some people who are in the engineering school have all voiced opinions on how they want to be environmentally conscious with their job and with their life. And I think that that's just kind of the culture that we're moving towards. Yeah, John, I definitely agree with you that it's the the culture is moving towards a green movement. And it's not only a social or a cultural thing, but it's it's an economical factor. Like recently, the Rockefeller family just announced that they're actually completely divesting from oil, which is what made them the trillions and trillions of dollars they've made over the past uh, few decades and just that alone shows that it's just it's not sustainable to stay in the oil and fossil fuel industry i mean it's the rockefellers it's the dubai the saudi arabian investment funds they're all getting out of fossil fuels and moving towards renewables and that shows that it's it's not only a socially green movement but it's an economical movement and if the economics are there that's where the social constructs are going to move to because people always need money. And if something is more inexpensive and more effective, that's the direction that I think our society is going to move into. That's an interesting point, Brandon. And I have to ask, where's nuclear in that equation? You you talk about the economics of fossil fuel, people divesting from fossil fuels and embracing renewables. Where's nuclear in that equation? From our time with this project, I definitely know that nuclear is still a force to be reckoned with, and a lot of people are for it, and a lot of people are against it. But when we went and talked to UVM professor Jenny Stevens about our project and where to get sources and stuff, she had the general mindset that nuclear was a done deal and uh, it's on the way out. And I feel like that is slightly the thinking of most people in the academic world. So, Brandon, you discussed the divestment of, like, the Rockefellers from fossil fuels. Recently, we've seen large investments from companies like Google, Apple, Disney in renewable energy. The big investors of nuclear power is the government. Government subsidies are a major factor when it comes to nuclear. We see Energy Corporation, a private LLC, buying nuclear reactors and nuclear power plants, but it's heavily subsidized by the government. So as a follow-up question, I have to ask, where's the nuclear sort of fall in this discussion on an academic standpoint of renewables and fossil fuels? And have you spoken to any professors about it? Well, actually, for this project, we went and talked to UVM professor Jenny Stevens, and I can't say that it's a consensus for the entire academic community, but when we talked to her, it seemed like she thought that nuclear is really on its way out, and what we were hypothesizing in our report was kind of already happening. From what I have learned doing the project and being part of Fairwinds, it's definitely not completely on its way out because there's definitely a lot of people that are still proponents for nuclear energy. But from what we've heard from her, it seems like some people think that nuclear's already one foot out the door. 
Your discussion is especially interesting to me because of some work Caroline has been doing here at Fairwinds with another researcher from UVM that we have with us this summer. And you all talked about there would be a necessity of 2,891 nuclear reactors to make this 20% goal. You mentioned that earlier. Yet Caroline and Ben uncovered a real discrepancy on how many nuclear engineers are coming out and how many people, for example, are studying environmental. There's a thing called an elevator speech. And imagine yourself getting on a, an elevator with uh, the next president of the United States, and you've got one floor to make your point before he or she gets off. And um, so in one floor on the elevator, what would you tell the next president of the United States about this study we just completed? The installation of nuclear technology takes twice as long and costs twice as much as wind power. So it would be more effective both economically and time-wise to install wind over nuclear energy. After reviewing data of total life cost analysis of nuclear and renewable energies and the construction time, nuclear energy is almost twice as expensive as, as wind. We have a short time window to address the issues of climate change, and we only have so much money to be able to do so while also retaining other parts of our economy. So in regard to trying to combat the issues of climate change effectively, if we want to do it in the shortest amount of time and use the least amount of money, then renewable energy is definitely the way to go versus nuclear energy. So we have looked at the numbers, and when it comes to capacity factor and total cost of energies, we've looked at three different energies, nuclear, wind, and solar. And it comes down to nuclear being a lot more money than both of the other renewable energies, and that just leads to one conclusion, and that it's illogical to invest in anything else except for renewable energies. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and most importantly, for spending a whole term with us doing this project, undertaking the challenge. And I know that I want to hold in reserve that sometime next year we can get in contact with you all either together here or via phone or, or Skype so that we can have another discussion and, and see where things are happening at that time. So, Brandon, Grayson, Sam, John, I want to thank you for joining the Fairwinds crew today and for the whole term you were with us. Fairwinds listeners, we'll keep you informed.